Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Michael, can you talk to us about the purpose of the Council of Nicaea and its ties to sun worship? Oh, ties to sun worship. Yeah, it's one of those pagan elements that appeared and had to be dealt with. The patriarchs of early Christianity were members of various important cults. The ones I can remember are Sol Invictus, Cult of Mithras, Cult of Serp Serapis, which was a sort of Egyptian. It's really Horus cult is what it was. And then you have elements of other Persian motifs. Uh, Persia had many secret societies. They had Zoroastrianism, don't forget. You had the cult of Ahura Mazda. Uh, I've gone into all of this. So there was, uh, oh yeah, and there was even uh, the Silesian pirates, oddball Mediterranean groups in Italy. Uh, all of this contributing. You know, you just, there's a book called Cults of the Roman Empire. That alone will just astound you. Because remember, all the gods and goddesses, the ones that we know, like Jupiter and Hera and all of this and Ares, they all had cults of their own. So the, there's no end of cults. But what happened was the homogenization of these different cults formed what we now know to be as Christianity. One of the most important groups is the cult of Orpheus, the Orphics. But their work was systematically burned. So... The council, the council of Nicaea is only one council of many where they had to sit down and deal with this cornucopia of different cultic elements. Which ones would remain within the Christian corpus that were deemed okay? This is a sort of a random thing. And ones that were definitely not okay and they were going to get rid of for any number of reasons. We, we're not there, so we can't tell what was going on. But this involved massacres because there was attendees at these different uh, conventions of presbyters who adamantly wanted their little gig in, included in the corpus and fought tooth and nail. They, they wouldn't back down. So Constantine just had them slaughtered, literally taken out into the yard, taken out into the, you know, the square there and, and, and murdered because that'll take care of them then that's how scrub that that's exactly what happened and the expert on this subject is an author called tony bushby if people get into his work you know and i've got a page that summarizes all of his work on the uh astrotheology site i've moved that page around a bit but if you go to astrotheologyzone.com look in the appendix section you'll see tony bushby and click on that and you'll get a, an eyeful there of, of his work on this. So you've got to realize that uh, it was a job and a half. And they had all of this Persian mysticism you know, from this kind of fallen empire because by the time you even get to the cult of Zoroaster, the Persian empire is in decline. They've had many wars and they've had many disputes and rival groups have taken over, and some of the old guard who were Mithras worshippers are now dead and gone. And so you've got this kind of hybrid. But it was enough, at least, for, for, to, for uh, these Christian uh, patriarchs and presbyters to abstract from and say, we like that piece. That's really tasty, especially that part about the hero, you know, when he fought the dragon. You see, because these dramatic elements were preserved, and then they get into the Chronicles. So... It was only one of many, many uh, moments in which a, a great councils had to meet. And they had, and the, of course, the problem there was goddess cults. Now, these goddess cults would finally make an appearance much later on. What was the council, a Trillo or something like that, where the Mother Mary motif is brought back into Christianity. But at the time of Constantine, that was a no-no. And the reason was is simply the goddess cults were too well known. In fact, Constantine's mother, Helen, was a member of one of these cults and was considered almost like a, a high priestess matriarch in the cult of Isis or Venus or whatever it was. Uh, Vatican City is partly built over cult, uh, you know, shrines of Venus as well as Mithras. That would have been Sabel, v Venus in her uh, other aspect as the goddess Sabel, mother of Mithra. So the whole of the Vatican City is built on a temple to Mithra. And by the way, in Persian, Mithra is a female term. It's feminine. Because as I said, the child of the goddess 
is her acolyte and his names and many of the motifs around him actually betray the fact that there's a, a higher goddess behind him and he just represents her there's no different with the story of mother mary giving birth to jesus the whole thing was reprised again and then of course you have the star in the heavens don't you that was the sun alternatively it could be venus but in either sense depending what tradition you're coming from it's a mithras it's from the cult of mithras so yeah the 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 appropriation is unbelievable said another at another time that the kabbalah is from sabel early early goddess magic that either the jews picked up on or more likely the greeks because the greek had greeks had a big big empire every single scholar today in history will always admit that roman empire is basically based on the greeks right their architecture was taken wholesale their pantheons were taken wholesale and everything else was taken wholesale what is in the roman is really the grecian but what is in the grecian they had an empire that stretched to egypt remember uh, and, and then alexander the great and all of that before them right so egypt plays a big role here persia they were always in fights with the persian king cyrus <clears throat> parthia babylon assyria whatever you've got we we have to remember this uh, dispersion and this uh, synthesis of elements and so the christian for forefathers the, the patriarchs were lumbered with this task as well and uh, like i said constantine himself died as a member of still of Sol Invictus. So a lot of shenanigans had to be done to try and distance Constantine. And so even the motifs that you find in the early works of history, and uh, Constantine chose Christianity out of a, a plethora of other religions because he saw this cross in the sky on the Malvern Bridge, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. A lot of that is still solar worship. Uh, which harkens back to the solar cult. So after years of studying this, I suddenly realized that behind these various cults I've just mentioned is a much more sinister cult, which can be tracked like Ralph Ellis has tracked it. He calls them the Atnists to Parthia and to Akhenaten's Egypt. And my research corroborates all of that. We're basically on the same page. I just add that there were Setian Atnists because of some of the imagery. And I overemphasize the female uh, Kayan as well. But other than that, he is the man who's the greatest scholar of the 20th century, if not much, much longer, because he's actually gone and uncovered a lot of this. And he knows full well what we're talking about. So Saul Invictus is really a front for the earlier Atonist cult that worshiped the sun. It's very, very ancient. It's the solar cult. But the solar cult precedes Akhenaten's Atonists, going back through the Amonists. So my Irish origins is called that, Irish origins of civilization, but it's a lot about Egypt as well, because the Amonists are nothing but the Egyptian Druids. They were actually connected. And all the symbolism, the fact that they loved the triangle and the three, they had always had Trinity, a father, a god and a goddess and a child. The fact that they were the serpent in different forms, the serpent appears. The, the worship of the goddess, and on and on it goes, all these different motifs are identical in Britain, of the ancient Britain, and also in Egypt. And then when you find out that the first pharaoh of the first dynasty of Egypt, King Menes, is buried in Northern Ireland, we might be onto something there. When we find out that Egyptian boats have been dug up from the mud of England, and faience beads, which are Egyptian beads, have been discovered in Ireland and England. And when we find out that Irish torques, there's a particular kind of bracelet only made there, are found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, hundreds of them, not one. And on and on and on and on it goes, as I personally have unpacked these deep connections between the West and the East. This is blows the top off all the lies we've been told. Cocaine has been found in the tombs of the mummies that could never be Egyptian, it's grown in South America. Pictures of elephants have been found in Egypt. Uh, Barbary apes, which are only found in, in the Mediterranean, have been found mummified and buried in Northern Ireland, in the, in the goddess, in the, in the tombs of, of queens, dedicated to the goddess. 
uh, parrot feathers discovered in the tombs of Egypt. And on and on it goes. And even in South America and in North America, you find all of this uh, Phoenician coins and markings. It's just, it's unbelievable. But the scholars who've discovered all of that were all hinterlanded by the Smithsonian Institute and the Royal Academy. You see, they've all been suppressed. But I know all of their work and I'll know all of their names and put it into the websites for people to track themselves and find out. It actually gets really incredible when you get into it. This, uh, so when you say the, the Greek, the Kabbalah could have been Greek. Yeah, but the Greeks had an empire all over the world. So maybe it's, it's, it could be Greek, but the Greeks could have abstracted it from somewhere else, just like the Romans abstracted numerous motifs that were the foundation of their empire, including the letters of their alphabet, were all taken from Greek. Greek culture was Romanized. That's all it was. Well, the Greeks could have done the same thing. Did they take from the Etruscans and the Mycenaeans and the Cretans, from the Philistines and the Egyptians and the Scythians? The answer is absolutely they did. Right? And you have Ionians and you have Dorians. And they, they've hidden the truth about them because they're all Aryans. They're blonde and blue-eyed, and they know they came from the north. But that motif, you see, during the 20th century became so taboo and politically incorrect that that's all been hidden, and people get up in arms about it. Look, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in the elements of civilization and where they came from. I couldn't give a damn about all the other stuff. But people obviously do. The very word Irish comes from Aryan. The very word Iran is a, is a corruption of the word Aryan. You know, facts are facts. And the Arya is well known to have got to Pakistan. That was one of their greatest homelands. And they had thousands and thousands of colonies on the banks of the Sarasvati River, but that river dried up in ancient times. So it's only now, guess what they did? Satellite photographs and all those villages. Millions of people lived upon the Sarasvati River and all of them were inspired by the Aryans. And you have Harappa and Mohanjo-Daro and unfortunately those places got destroyed. And the satellite photographs have shown these settlements. It's physical. It cannot be denied. It's as the ancient chronicles always said that these settlements came from people from the north. They found the evidence. And while they were doing this uh, kind of research, these uh, incredible satellite photographs, they found evidence of the land bridges that were never meant to exist, joining up many of these countries. There's a land bridge between Ceylon, the Sri Lanka, and India. And guess what? Between Norway and Britain and between France and Britain, and probably between Ireland and England, of which the Isle of Man is a remnant. They found evidence of the land bridges when the waters were way, way, way less than they were today. And that is why everyone in these coastal villages of Britain always see bizarre artifacts floating up from lost sunken islands it's all over. The, all over. And when they try to take it to the museums and they try to tell it, Nobody wants to hear. They just make up some stupid excuse. Oh, that came from a wreck. That came from some boat that sank. And everybody knows that's bullshit. In ancient times, and I, no, not even in ancient times, 100 years ago in Ireland, in certain places like the Aran Islands and, and places like that, when the water just simply receded, people could see ancient, the remnants of ancient lands, just because the tide had gone out of a season. It was in the folklore. Then, about uh, 20 years ago, National Geographic did an absolutely in-depth study of the shorelines of the UK, all Britain and Ireland, uh, sonar, whatever they use, this new, new technology. They went down there, discovered the actual lineaments of the coastlines of Britain. To their absolute horror, they found out evidence of catastrophism, not uniformitarianism. Catastrophism has proven that there was something that sheared off the, the way Britain looks now when you see it on the map, right? Those contours and those shorelines revealed all over Britain catastrophism. Oh, my God. So they just suppressed it. I've got, you know, information on my websites. But they just, that never was broadcast. They didn't know what to do with it because it went against the entire subject of geology. They talked about very slow movements over millions of years. It's called uniformitarianism and everybody's meant to believe it. Evidence was discovered by the most senior and the most expensive investigation that has ever been known proved the opposite. But the men who wrote about catastrophism down through the centuries, Ignatius Donnelly, Cummins Beaumont, Emmanuel Velikovsky, were all basically died in poverty and died in obscurity. 
We didn't, and everything they've been proven is correct. Other books that even came after them have been suppressed. But you can get hold of Alan and Dallaire's book, Catastrophe, uh, sorry, Cataclysm. It's still available and get it quick because it's not going to be. And if you can get their other book, I'll give you five bucks. If you, if you can find their original book, When the Earth Nearly Died, because the, the, they've done some real shenanigans on that. Another author wrote a book with exactly the same name in order to distract you. But the work is out there. I've been collecting it all my life. These incredible stories. One of these groups is the Phoenicians. More lies have been told about them than you can imagine. And they contribute to the Bible. They're known, they're known in biblical lore as the Canaanites. But they're, they, they're really known by ancient people. One of the names is Phoenician. Now, however, they never used that word for themselves. Their name for themselves was Arcadian. And that is a slight corruption of a word Orcad, which is Scotland. So the Arcadians, Arc already means, you know, above north. And the Arcadians from Arcadia, which is another paradisical garden, remember, and I've talked before about the Arctic homeland. One of the names of the Arctic homeland was Arcadia. The Greeks picked it up, but it's really a reference to the Hyperborea. But Hyperborea included everything in the Arctic Circle and also included the north of Scotland, where these Arcadians also had uh, settlements, just like the Danes own Greenland and Iceland. There's nothing different in what we're talking about. The Vikings in later age came to Dublin. A whole bunch of Scottish words because they, they fished around Scotland. Many, many Scottish words like bairn for child or, or Scandinavian words. B, when you see wit B, right? the B-Y was B-E is a Viking word meaning homestead. So the, the, the presence of later Vikings is no different than the earlier races that I'm talking about. There's absolutely no difference, but somehow there's a cognitive dissonance that this group could never have traveled here and there and other. But later on, you find exactly the same thing. Spanish mariners had charted the whole of the UK for fishing purposes and others. In fact, when the Spanish Armada took place, the Spanish already knew where to go when they sent their, you know, their Armada up to the ports of uh, Britain, they already had for hundreds of years known where to send them. So the lies, the blatant lies that have been told, but this Phoenician group also plays a very deep role in culture. Some argue that Venetians, the Venetians come from the faux Venetians. There's a case to be made about that. So all of this contributes, right? The Phoenicians were the Canaanites in the Bible. Not that they lived there. That was just one of their settlements. They had settlements all along the Sea of Galilee and the, and the Mediterranean. So Silesian pirates. You see, the, there's the Italian merchants. There's the later Knights Hospitaller. A lot of these different groups have incredible roots. <coughs> so Constantine's roots go through Parthia back to Egypt. Setian Atnists who were finally thrown out after Akhenaten's reign. He was so unpopular that Egypt threw him out. And he and his descendants, he had six girls. Four died in a famine and two remained. One, I think, if I can remember correctly, changed her tactics, stopped being an Atnist and married the, the Amonist Pharaoh who took over, Haram Heb. And he's the golden bull we've talked about, you know, when Moses gets to the desert and, and uh, his people put up the golden bull, the golden calf. It was a symbol to the Pharaoh who was reigning at the time. We love you, mate. Come and get us. We're sorry for what we've done. These are the chosen people who are you know, a part of the Exodus. Some group broke away and said, we're going back. We don't like you, Moses. And we don't like where you're leading us to Timbuktu here. And we're not believing in any of your shit anymore. And we don't believe in that age of Aries. Right. Well, that was a Pharaoh, Haram Heb. He was married to one of Akhenaten's daughters who survived. The other daughter became the leader of the Atnists. Do you want to know where she's buried? County Kerry, Ireland. Now, you're in Egypt. You've been thrown out. There's lots of countries all over the place, many of them just itching to welcome a pharaoh's daughter. But she's buried in County Kerry in Southern Ireland. The first king of the first pharaoh 
the first pharaoh of the first dynasty of Egypt is buried in Northern Ireland. Barbary apes have been found in tombs of Irish queens. References to particular places in Ireland have been found in Egyptian papyrus. And you tell me there's no commerce between those places? So this cult of Akhenaten, this cult of Aton, spread throughout the whole world. And that's the true story of the creation of, of, of what we know as Christianity. It's a version of solar worship. So when they say, well, we're monotheists. Yeah, well, so is Akhenaten. But guess what? So were the people before him. Akhenaten was indeed a monotheist. But the Amonists prior to him, with their Amun-Ra, could be considered the first monotheists. So the story goes back to ancient Egypt. I've been studying it since the 70s. I came across Ralph Ellis's work, and oh my God, pieces that I had that just didn't fit together. By the time I was reading him in the 90s, I went, who is this guy? He's answering every single question that I'd studied the world's volumes and couldn't find the answers, or a little bit here, a little bit there. But nobody had taken it, shaken it down, and put it in, in, in an unbelievable encyclopedic order. It was joy for me to read this man's work, you see, and then later to personally know him and uh, have him on as a guest and all of that. And I know you have as well. This man's work is absolutely unbelievable, and it's very, very corroborative of work that I was doing. He's probably the most important scholar in that whole study. Not the only one, but certainly the most important because he's done work that you could travel through all the books and research, and there's lots of blanks. There's things you're just not going to understand. You know, if you go to some of the top Jewish scholars, think of Max DeMont, God, Jews, and History, this incredible book. And he opens by telling you there's no such thing as the, as the 10 tribes of Israel. These are all mythologies. The senior Jewish scholars, and there's many, many others, many, many others who take apart the traditional story and deconstruct it. And you get many Christian scholars who've, like the, you know, who've done their homework, and you need to take them. They have the alternative story. But the, the Council of Nicaea is just simply a, a moment in which occult forces sat down and decided what was going to be the dominant uh, sort of trend here. And of course, sun worship was just transmogrified and the child of the sun or the son of the sun. And for 600 years, you know, uh, 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 Jesus was shown as a, a, beard, a beardless youth, no beard and young, just like Dionysus, just like Orpheus. Uh, the fish came out of the labyrinth and was at attached to Jesus when everybody at that time knew the fish is the sign of uh, Dionysus. And, and a few other gods, you know, can, was associated with that. It might even be astrologically connected to the sign of Pisces. So the fisherman's ring and all the, the mitre, you know, all the Christian ideologues took the fish symbol. But that is, their very Vatican is based over Mithras. <clears throat> <clears throat> All of that. So when you start decoding these stories in Christianity, why did St. Paul, uh, why did St. Peter hang on an upside down cross? Uh, uh, what is the role of Mary Magdalene? Seems very odd, that one. Uh, and all the rest of these different motifs. You'll come across the pagan origins of it. But just to realize that there's not one source, but there's many. And the Greeks, you know, uh, Augustus, Caesar, and many other Caesars were the ones that if you touch their robe, you would become immediately healed. How many people, how many Christians know that? That umpteen of these Caesars, long before the story of Jesus, were the ones who could bestow magical powers and heal the blind and heal the sick. It goes on and on and on. Uh, all of these different motifs. So people are welcome to go over to astrotheologyzone.com. My first site was uh, stolen from me for reasons that should be obvious. So I had to represent all of the information. Uh, Again, because there's forces out there who don't want this information broadcast, to say the least. But we formed astrotheologyzone.com and try to put as much of this information as there. The Trees of Life book and other works that I've done you know, through my life to bring the salient parts to bear. So that uh, Christians, Christians at least know what they're believing in. Uh, you know, because it was, there's an amazing scam has happened here with this extraordinary cornucopia that's been slowly massaged through the years to get to be codified and homogenized you know why do the priests wear the white 
uh, circlet around their neck. You know, why do they wear the black robes? How much debt is there to Judaism? And if they and if we accept it that the Judaism, uh, then surely that can't be the only one. Because what is Judaism? What is the roots of Judaism? So this thing wholly, wholly opens up and becomes a really fascinating study. Michael Tazarian, thank you.